So, uh, you know, years and years ago when they first started doing IVF, no one was even freezing embryos. They were just doing them all fresh. And we started out very early embryo transfers. Then they kind of waited till day three. And then eventually people started moving more towards the day five blastocyst embryo transfers. And there's a variety of reasons for that, but the progression allowed us to kind of get to the point where we could choose very robust embryos that we anticipate will have a really good chance of providing you with success when you're trying to actually conceive and get pregnant. So right now, the big question is, should we do more in order to make sure that the embryo and the lining of the uterus are in sync and that none of your hormones are going to interfere? Why is that important? Well, when you're going through an IVF cycle or even IUI, your estrogen levels start to climb as you produce more eggs. So the more eggs you produce, the higher your estrogen level goes. That has an effect in your body, in your bloodstream, and in the uterus itself. So when the estrogen levels get really high, this is thought to be fairly detrimental to the overall sort of standing and case for everybody because we know that if your estrogen levels are quite high, there's higher risks during the pregnancy and potentially people started saying, maybe this isn't such a good thing for the actual success rate of the embryo transfer. How do you solve that problem? Well, there's no way to solve it during your IVF cycle. But there is a way to solve it by freezing the embryos and then coming back with just a little bit of estrogen and then progesterone. So you're avoiding those really high progesterone or estrogen levels. Additionally, people have now realized that your progesterone level at the time when you trigger for the egg retrieval can be very predictive of your outcome. So if you have very low progesterone levels, the thought was, you probably have a normal endometrium. It's not going to be advanced in comparison to where your embryo is. So you're probably okay to go ahead. Whereas if you had a high progesterone level, the lining of your uterus is already exposed to a high progesterone level. And because of that, it's now acting like you've already released your egg. If the lining and the embryo are not in sync with one another, you're gonna get what's called endometrial asynchrony, and that can result in repeated failure or failures and, and even miscarriages potentially as well. The whole basis of some of the endometrial function tests that are available, like the ERA test we've reviewed on the show, is to detect if your endometrium is in sync with your embryo. Now, we don't do the ERA test and we've reviewed that test, it does not work but purely your progesterone level has been shown over and over again to be predictive. So that one element is important in terms of determining if you have success or not when you're going through an IVF cycle. So along came uh, multiple studies around this area and last year, I think it was around the winter time and you can find it on our YouTube channel, um, www.youtube.com slash Dr. Victory, DR Victory. So there you can find our interview with one of our patients and at the same time prior to interviewing her, we also reviewed whether frozen or fresh uh, make a difference. So more recently, in fact, it hasn't even been published yet and I love giving you guys the unpublished stuff because I've got access to it so you get it before anybody else does. There is another study which looked at three randomized controlled trials and they evaluated whether the fresh or the frozen embryo transfers had different success rates and they based it on the progesterone level. So this is really important because we want to make sure that we're giving you, first of all, up-to-date information. Second of all, we want to make sure it's the best quality information. And third, we want to make sure it's kind of comprehensive. It applies to you or you can take it back and apply it to your scenario. So just to kind of delve into this a little bit, randomized controlled trials are the best form of scientific investigation that we have. So if you're going through a randomized controlled trial, essentially what you're doing is taking two groups of patients, one on each side, one half is getting one treatment and the other half is getting another. And often it's in a placebo controlled trial where 
one half is getting, for example, a medication and the other half is getting a placebo and they don't realize that it's actually not the medication. And you are randomly assigning the patients to those groups. There's all sorts of ways to do it. That's not really critical, but essentially you just don't get to choose, I wanna take the med or the placebo. You get assigned to it and you as the patient and us as the physicians or researchers don't actually know which group you're in. So that gives you the absolute best quality evidence because at the end of it all, you can control for all the confounding variables, you can do all the calculations, you can really come up with some robust data to give patients answers to the questions that they wanna know. So this particular study went back and looked at the outcomes from three previously run randomized controlled trials. So essentially they took the data from those trials and they re-ran them uh, to look specifically at the question they were looking for. So the study included a total of 5,137 women who had progesterone testing on the day that they were getting their HCG shot to trigger for release of the eggs. And at the end of it all, they had 2,516 women, 49% that ended up achieving a live birth. And when they looked at the specifics, 2,612 women actually underwent a frozen embryo transfer and 2,600, sorry, 2,525 had a fresh embryo transfer. So I'm just gonna pull up that study for you. We can have a look at that and uh, um, we can share that together here. Uh, whoops, wrong thing. Okay, application window, and you're right there. Share. Okay, so uh, you should be able to see if you're watching on YouTube or Twitter or Facebook. Those of you on Instagram, I will um, kind of share the data with you, so don't worry, but uh, everybody else can actually see it. So um, I'm gonna kind of go through the information with you guys so that you can see uh, what they actually did. And um, we'll review the actual data from the study right here. Let's just pull this down. Okay, so the first one you want to look at is right here. So this is the baseline characteristics in the study. So essentially what they showed was there was no real significant clinical differences between the groups. So they looked at their age, um, it was on average 28.5, so a pretty young group of patients. Body mass index was very low, 22.6 versus 22.8, so 22.6 was in the frozen group, 22.8 in the fresh. There was a statistically significant difference, but that makes no clinical difference whatsoever. Um, the duration of infertility was the same, number of patients with previous pregnancy was the same. Um, there was a difference in the number of eggs that they had, it was a slight bit less in the frozen an embryo group but that slight less was 0.5 so that actually again does not make any difference so all of this stuff was pretty realistically the same between all the groups so reasonably even um, you know availability of the patients so when they looked at the outcomes of the stimulation that's what you can see here let me just kind of position it for you guys so you can see the duration of ovarian stimulation was the same so same number of days on average about nine and a half almost 10 days of stimulation. The dosages were essentially the same between the two groups. The estradiol concentrations were different, but again, probably not clinically different, a little bit higher in the frozen embryo transfer group. And the progesterone concentrations were a tiny bit, again, not clinically significant, higher in the frozen embryo transfer group. Um, the endometrial thickness was the same. They did have about one and a half more eggs in the frozen embryo transfer group on average compared to the frozen embryo or to the fresh embryo group, so 14.2 versus 12.7. Um, and then the number of embryos transferred was almost the same, 1.6 versus 1.7. The rest of the data was essentially the same. There was a slight bit more uh, number of patients with high-grade embryos, or at least one high-grade embryo in the frozen embryo transfer group. But look at how small these differences are. 95.7% of the patients versus 93.5% of the patients. So yes, it's slightly different, but 2.2% is not a huge number when you're looking at 90% overall.
So essentially they wanted to now study this and look at what the outcomes were to see how much of a difference this made. And what they found out was that if you look at the progesterone levels and how predictive they are, they ran something called an ROC curve, which is a, an assessment of the sort of sensitivity and specificity of the data that you're looking at. And they found that a cutoff of 1.14 nanograms per mil was the best cutoff for determining whether or not you were gonna succeed or not in your IVF cycle. So for those of you, again, watching online and you can see what I've got in the screen share here, there's four graphs up with uh, progesterone concentrations graphed versus the outcomes. The blue line is the, um, the frozen embryo transfers and the red line is the fresh. So pretty much in every single graph, and they looked at conception rate, they looked at clinical pregnancy, they looked at miscarriage, and they looked at live birth rates. At the start, up until you get to around the 1.14 nanograms per mil of progesterone, they're fairly even in terms of the success rates, whether you're fresh or you're frozen. It does overall kind of favor the frozen, but it's definitely you know, fairly similar. We're not seeing huge differences there for conception rate, clinical pregnancy rate. Miscarriage rate was actually a little bit lower in the frozen embryo transfer group versus the fresh, and live birth rate seemed to be persistently sort of higher in the frozen embryo transfer rate. But conception and clinical pregnancy are pretty much the same. Once you get past 1.13, 1.4 nanograms per mil, the lines diverge. So the frozen embryo transfer rate stays fairly flat and the fresh embryo transfer rate starts to decline. And it's very, very significant. Live birth rate, you're looking at like a 57, 58% success rate versus something that's uh, more in the high 30s. And I'll, I'll go over the actual numbers with you. So it's, it's very significantly different, like a 20% drop in success based on that progesterone level. So what they're essentially saying is if your progesterone level is elevated on the day that you are triggering, you probably should be freezing your embryos. And here's the really important part of the data. So they, looked at the two subgroups in terms of pure numbers from the graphs I just showed you. This is sort of the numerical format now being presented and they divided it for those that were less than 1.14 and those that were higher than 1.14. So in this side on, the, on my left of the screen, probably you're right if you're looking at this, um, for those that were less than 1.14 nanograms per mil, conception rate was the same. Clinical pregnancy rate overall was the same, and that's what these p-values mean. If it's not less than 0.05, there's no difference. But when they got to the pregnancy loss rate, you had a 20.1% miscarriage rate in the frozen embryo transfer group, but a 25% rate in the fresh embryo transfer group. So they're saying, and that was very highly significant, that if you're doing a fresh embryo transfer, even when the progesterone is low, you have almost a 20% higher risk, 5% in actual number, but that's a 20% um, increase or 25% increase. There's a 25% increased risk of a miscarriage compared to what you'd get if you did a frozen embryo transfer. When you go to live birth, it was also statistically significantly higher in the frozen embryo transfer, but again, clinically, maybe not that meaningful, 53.3% versus 48.1%. So if your progesterone's low, your conception rate and your clinical pregnancy rate are gonna end up being the same, but your pregnancy loss or miscarriage rate will be about 5% lower um, in absolute numbers or a 20% difference. Uh, and when you looked at live birth rates, it's only about a 5% absolute number difference um, and for some people that's everything, right? So it's still worth considering. Here's the real sort of meat and potatoes of this study. It's when you look at the patients where their progesterone level was more than 1.14 on the day of H HCG administration. So in these patients, everything is highly significant. The conception rate, 70.2 in the frozen embryo transfer rate, 
versus only 53%, 53.7 in the fresh embryo transfer group. The clinical pregnancy rate, 61.7 versus only 44% in the uh, fresh embryo transfer group. Looking at the pregnancy loss rate, it's 22.5% in the frozen embryo transfer group. It's actually quite high, 27.8% in the fresh group, which is kind of almost anomalously high. So that one's a bit of a stretch for me. I need to figure out why they're miscarriage rate is so high. Um, not all of these obviously were PGT tested and they don't have that data or present that data here, but certainly it's something to consider. Um, but considering the average age of these patients, we wouldn't recommend that you do PGT at that age anyway. So um, it makes sense to you know have some miscarriage rate, but 27 is, is quite high. And then the live birth rate is the really important one. So here you have 52.7 in the fresh embryo, or sorry, the frozen embryo transfer group versus only 37.3% in the fresh embryo transfer group. So the question is, does a frozen embryo transfer benefit you versus a fresh embryo transfer? And the answer is yes. It, seriously benefits you. Clearly, if you are going through an IVF cycle and you have even a low or normal progesterone level on the day of HCG administration, you're still going to get a statistically lower success rate if you do a fresh embryo transfer and a statistically significantly higher miscarriage rate. Whereas if you do frozen, you definitely eliminate those things. In addition to that, if your progesterone level is high, and I can tell you just empirically based on my own experience, many patients have higher progesterone levels, especially with that very tight, low threshold these guys are using, then you're definitely going to want to freeze because now you're seeing a huge difference, that 52.7 versus the 37%. Uh, live birth rate and still that increased risk of miscarriage in the fresh embryo transfers compared to frozen. So factor fiction is a frozen embryo transfer better than a fresh embryo transfer. It is a fact that your frozen embryo transfer will likely yield better results and reduce your miscarriage rates it now seems compared to a fresh embryo transfer. And so it should be considered by most patients. Is it important or imperative for everyone? No. IVF and fertility is never cookie cutter medicine. So we definitely don't want you thinking everybody should have a frozen embryo transfer, but it looks like it's definitely beneficial for the majority of patients. And you definitely need to keep that in your fertility toolbox when you're discussing with your team or your physician. We have for years now moved towards a frozen embryo transfer um, program. And uh, my, I know the former program I was working with wasn't as fond of it. I think they've gone back to fresh. Um, I'm not uh, obviously working there anymore, but I still obviously go with the data. And I know that the data is strongly supportive of the frozen embryo transfers. So that's really what should be done for the vast majority of patients. So if you're being pushed into a fresh, ask why, find out what the rationale is. What are the benefits for you? Why are they doing it fresh? <laughs> Certainly if you're just doing something simple like a natural IVF cycle, it makes sense. You have barely any rise in your progesterone, barely any rise in your estrogen levels. And so there's probably going to be very little compromise or any even real difference compared to what you would naturally be doing just having intercourse and trying to conceive. But once we start stimulating your ovaries to make extra eggs, it's a whole other issue because those estrogen levels come into play, the progesterone levels come into play, and you will not see the same success rates. So as always, please make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel, like, comment, share. We wanna make sure that you guys are on there looking at all the different videos that we have. Right now, our video on saline infusion sauna histograms, for those of you that are worried about having one, has been going bonkers, thanks to our wonderful patient who is willing to let me do it on her live. Um, we're probably gonna do another one very soon for you guys to see and make sure that you are on there and, and supporting us there because uh, we definitely wanna grow that YouTube channel and it really is probably the best place to view the video because you can see the screen sharing that I'm doing with you. Okay, so we are gonna start taking some questions.